Hi, I'm Steph the Sleuth, here on behalf of Mentor Lawyer. Mentor Lawyer is done with my review of Don Adelson's 2023 planner. He read it from the beginning to the end, and he thought about his findings and how the evidence from the planner could impact the case against Donna. In this video, Mentor Lawyer asked me to share the image of the most important posts in the calendar that he identified during his final deep dive into Donna's calendar. Before I show you them and read them to you as we interpret them, I will read you Mentor Lawyer's introduction and part of his overall analysis. Please note that he will discuss not only what he found in the planner, and perhaps more importantly, of what was not in the planner, because sometimes what is not there may be even more important than what is there. This video will have two parts, and this is part one. Keep in mind that it is difficult to know when some of the entries were put into the planner. There are clear indications that Donna used the documents for planning purposes, but she also added spontaneous notes here and there. Sometimes the context of what is written helps us better understand whether it was written ahead of time or on the date it appeared on the calendar. Clearly, just because something is on the calendar, it does not mean it happened. For example, if a note says, tell Wendy, we can't tell whether she told Wendy unless there are subsequent notes that suggest or prove that she did. Furthermore, the notes are in Donna's handwriting, and some are difficult to decipher. Let's start with the background. The planner covers the year 2023, a crucial year for the Adelson family. The writer of the planner is Donna Adelson. This is clear from the context of many of the notes. The planner was acquired by the state pursuant to a search warrant after Donna's November 2023 arrest. The planner was written by Donna between late 2022 and November 13, 2023, when she was arrested. The planner was confiscated by the state of Florida as evidence in the murder case now pending against Donna Adelson. The victim in the case is Donna's former son-in-law, Dan Markell, who was murdered in July of 2014. At the time Donna wrote her planner, she had not been charged in connection with the murder. However, since 2016, case detectives have indicated that it is their belief that the murder was a hit ordered by four members of the South Florida Adelson family, of which Donna is the matriarch. There are two versions of what happened. Let's start with the detective's version. According to Tallahassee Police Department and FBI detectives who worked on the case, a hit was put on Dan Markell primarily to enable his ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, to move to South Florida so Wendy Adelson and their kids could all be close to the rest of the family in South Florida. Investigators believe that four Adelsons were involved in the murder for hire conspiracy. Wendy Adelson, Charles Adelson, Donna Adelson, and Harvey Adelson. Within about two years of the murder, detectives concluded that two hitmen from Miami drove to Tallahassee to commit the murders on orders of the Adelsons. They also concluded that Wendy's brother, Charles Adelson, used his then-girlfriend, Catherine Meg Banois, to help hire the hitmen and to shield the hitmen and the Adelsons from each other. The hitmen would not have any direct contact with the people who hired them, and this made the Adelsons feel more comfortable that they could get away with the murder. So they went ahead and ordered the hit. The hit was ordered around the time when post-divorce litigation between Wendy and Dan was about to culminate in the taking of another sworn deposition of Wendy Adelson, and in the court holding a hearing and ruling on Dan Markell's strong accusations about his ex-wife and her attorney as well as regarding his motion to limit Donna Adelson's visitation of Dan and Wendy's boys. With the murder of Dan Markell taking place, the post-divorce litigation ended abruptly, and Wendy and her kids were no longer stuck in Tallahassee. The hitman option was chosen, the murder happened, and the killers and middlewoman were paid for the hit. Fast forward to 2023, the killers were caught and convicted, the middlewoman was caught and convicted, and now, about nine years after the murder, prosecutors are getting ready for the trial against the first Adelson charged. Charles Adelson. The other three Adelsons that the investigators suspected, Harvey, Donna, and Wendy Adelson, remained at large as unindicted co-conspirators. In the meantime, Charles sat in a Tallahassee, Florida jail, waiting for trial. Throughout 2023, it is obvious that Donna Adelson was very involved in the defense of her son's case. As you will see, many of the calendar entries mentor lawyer highlighted regarded preparation of the defense of her son. The Adelsons, through Charlie's defense and testimony, provided a different version of the events in question. At the 2023 trial of Charles Adelson, we learned of a totally new story, a defense presented by Charles Adelson, the first Adelson charged in connection with the murder. According to Charles Adelson, he did not hire any hitmen. Rather, in the months before the murder, he had been dating a single mother, Catherine McVanois, who came from a so-called other side of the track, and Charles shared with his girlfriend Catherine a lot of information about the ongoing dispute between the Adelsons and Dan Markell, including his hitman joke and the fact that the Adelsons were considering to offer Dan Markell 
$1 million so that Dan would allow Wendy to move to South Florida. According to Charles, Catherine shared some of this information with others from the other side of the tracks, and people connected to Catherine who heard this information decided on their own to do the murder and then to use Catherine to extort money from Charles Adelson to require the Adelsons to pay for the hit. Well, that is one possibility Charles advanced at trial. The other possibility, because he claimed that he was also a victim of the extortion and that he did not know the full truth, is that Catherine was involved all along in the plot to extort the Adelsons, and that Catherine simply pretended that she was being forced to help the conspirators collect from Charles Adelson. According to Charles, on the night of July 18, 2014, hours after Dan Markell was shot, Catherine came to his house demanding money and proclaiming innocence. He believed her, gave her all of the stapled cash he had in his possession, and he also agreed to go on a payment plan with Katie's help because he did not have enough cash to satisfy the demands of the killers slash extorters. Catherine supposedly had called the killers from outside of his home and negotiated with them on Charles' behalf, asking them to accept a lower payment and then to allow Charles to go on a payment plan for the remainder balance due. Later, according to Charles, he decided to pay the killers by check, and McBanois agreed. Charles claimed that he asked his mother Donna to write multiple checks to Catherine McBanois, all in the same amount for many months. He claimed that she became suspicious and began asking questions, and that ultimately he had to tell his mother, Donna Adelson, that he was being extorted, but that he believed that Catherine was not involved, and that the payments were not for her, but for the killers who were threatening and extorting him. If the state's theory of what happened is complicated, then so is Charles Adelson's story. Indeed, during his cross-examination, he had a difficult time explaining away the weaknesses in his story a story that seemed to be crafted to explain away every piece of evidence contained in the vast record the state obtained during the investigation, including several incriminating statements made by Charles Adelson, Catherine McManois, Harvey Adelson, and Donna Adelson on recorded phone conversations or in other serotypically recorded in-person conversations. For example, Charles Adelson had a difficult time explaining all the gifts to Catherine after the murder, considering that his testimony at times suggested that Charles suspected that Catherine was complicit in the conspiracy against him and that she was helping the killers. There are many holes in Charles Adelson's story, and the story unraveled during his cross-examination by prosecutor Georgia Kappelman. So let's return to the analysis of Donna's 2023 planner. This background is necessary because it informed how I would analyze the planner. To give the evidence context, I had to interpret it using different lenses. First, I decided to interpret the planner to determine if there is support in the calendar for the proposition that Donna was involved in the murder-for-hire plot. Second, I decided to interpret the planner from the Donna is innocent perspective to see whether there is support in the planner for the proposition that Donna is innocent. Let me give you one example. One of the fallacies in Charles' story is his explanation that for years he feared for his life and the life of his family, and therefore he never spoke a word about the extortion against him with anyone. But then, on the other hand, he was brave, willing, and able to get on the witness stand and explain everything that happened, including implicating the Latin kings as potential participants in the murder and in the conspiracy to extort him. Why didn't he explain everything to detectives when the killers were caught? Why didn't he explain everything to detectives when Catherine was caught and accused of being involved? Why didn't the Adelsons use their smarts to develop evidence against the extorters? Knowing that what they supposedly did on their own, the Adelsons could easily be made to look as people who ordered the hit. Why did the Adelsons stop making extortion payments after the detective's version of what happened became public? Why didn't the Adelsons undertake security measures at all times since the extortion started? There are many more questions like these about Charles' story. But if I were to assume that his crazy story was true, then what would I expect to see in the calendar? I thought about this issue as well as evaluating the entries in Donna's planner. Thus, when I saw the many entries of Donna writing down in the calendar, on several occasions, a list of questions for Charles Adelson's defense attorney, Dan Rashbaum, about the case against Charlie, or lists of peoples and companies she wanted to sue after her son Charles Adelson was acquitted, I thought about what should be included in these notes, and what should not be included in these notes, if Charles' story was true. For example, if Charles' story was true, there should be questions about security and the Latin kings. There should be questions about potential violence against Charlie while in jail or in prison after he testified. There should be questions about the safety of the family after Charlie testified. There shouldn't be questions about suing everyone, the state, the media, everyone who spoke ill of them. 
since Donna would have known that the Adelsons were entirely complicit in the media campaign against them because they hid the true story, not only from law enforcement, but also from the media. The Adelsons would understand that even under their story, detectives got nearly the entire story right. Even the involvement of the killers and the middlewoman, with the only missing piece being that the killers acted on their own and then forced the Adelsons to pay under threat that they would be killed or exposed. Now I will read the entries to you, with some commentary from Mentor Lawyer. For ease, we have numbered the entries, not in the manner that they appear in the planner, but by the number they appear on this video. Calendar Entry 1. Watch Kappelman closing. If he's guilty, he's guilty. Tell Wendy, tell Rose, where we are after we get there. Number 2. Charlie had paid child support in October. Number 3. Ask Dan. Lawsuits? Hearsay plus conjecture. Malicious ruining of dental practice plus egregious damage to the reputation of two dentists. Libel plus slander. 2020, Dateline, People ID, Tallahassee Police Department, Kaplman Comment, Daily Mail, Toronto and Miami News, Google, Yelp, Podcast, Rob plus Haritha. Order bar mitzvah photos. Mentor lawyer analysis. So the Adelsons think that they can hide the supposed truths that they're being extorted. And then, after it is revealed as a total surprise at trial that Charles is acquitted, they can sue everyone. What a joke. Number four, ask Dan for appointment. Number one, suits for Charlie. Number two, Alex. Number three, Adam. Number four, Ramsey. Number five, Sully. Number six, benefit of Amy Adler's depot. Number seven, US, Erica plus boyfriend. Number eight, psychologist for Charlie. Number nine, needs a visit. Seems confident. Mentor lawyer's analysis. It seems that Donna is knee deep into the preparation of Charles' defense. She seems to be trying to suggest friendly witnesses who could be used to support the ridiculous extortion defense. In the end, it seems that no one other than Charles is willing to commit perjury to support the extortion defense. Number five, Dan questions. Needs a visit. Today is five weeks. Seems more confident. Psychologist for Charlie. Erica plus boyfriend, benefit of Amy Adler depot, Sully, suit plus clothes for Charlie, called Mike Mintz. Mentor lawyer analysis. The suggestion of a psychologist for Charlie is interesting. Was Donna thinking of using a psychologist to try and explain away some of Charlie's conduct? Was she worried about him being depressed in jail? Sully is mentioned again. This seems to be Gerald Dawson, AKA Sully, a longtime friend of Charlie, whom I believe was interviewed by FBI Special Agent Sanford at some point. Erica Johnson, a long-term employee, was included in the defense witness list. As for the deposition of Professor Amy Adler, the law professor who was seeing Dan Markell during the time close to the murder, I wonder if Donna wanted to know how it went, or whether Dan Roshbaum proposed to take her deposition, and Donna wanted to know the benefit purpose. Number six, Charlie's passport. Where is it? Parentheses safe. Number seven, Dan, when is witness list going out? Why money prepared W for nothing? Mentor lawyer analysis. I wonder, is W standing for Wendy, witness list, or witnesses? Number eight, ask Dan, what does Charlie say about Kevin? Sully. Number nine, Dan to Sully, Erica, psychologist, Kevin, measure Charlie's inseam. Number 10, contact Erica and Dan, which day is good? Number 11, Wendy's 2023 pictures, clothes for Charlie, 35 inch inseam, 40 jacket, 16 H, undershirts, ask Jay, Tortuga's rental, tell Dan, need affidavits or new number for Wendy, unclear. Number 12, tell Dan I texted Erica, heard back. Number 13, did Erica write back? If not, Dan should call her. Number 14, order bar mitzvah photos, storage locker list. Ask Dan questions. Number one, psychologist, jury consultant. Number two, Erica, next visit. Number three, measure waist October. Smalls part of waist, measure chest. Mentor lawyer analysis. I definitely hope the investigators found the supposed storage locker. I would imagine that Donna would want to keep her 2013-2014 calendar for her memories. Number 15, Dan questions. Measure Charlie waist. Psychologist, Erica, Claudia, jury consultants. Number 16, did we hear from Mike Mintz? Number 17, Dan questions. 
Why would Jeff LaCasse be allowed to testify? Hearsay. Charlie, ADHD school. Vigilantism. Photos of video tampering? Emails? Go after Kappelman. Speaks on TV, local news, national TV, newspaper, podcasts, seeking higher office. Needs this win. Social media. Mentor lawyer's analysis. Again, seems that Donna is deeply involved in developing or suggesting strategies for Charles' defense. The ADHD question may support the conclusion that Donna was thinking of a psychologist to evaluate Charlie and explain away some of his behavior. Number 18. Ask Scott Radis. Any balance on furnishings? Mentor lawyer's analysis. More evidence on Vietnam property. Due to time constraints, we will continue with numbers 19 through 37 in a different video. As you can see, the questions Donna wanted to ask Dan Rashbaugh after the trial had nothing to do with the reality of what happened if the Adelson story was actually true, but rather were questions by an angry woman who got the ultimate victory in the war against Dan Markell and was now ready to take on the rest of the world that dared to cause any stress to the Adelsons. For example, there are no questions for Dan Rashbaum about how he will prove the supposed extortion. Rather, there are questions about whether certain people might help. Erica Johnson and her boyfriend, Mike Mintz. The help question suggests that Donna was hopeful that these people would play along with Charlie's story. Not that she hoped these people would testify and tell the truth. As we know, in the end, Charles' lawyers dropped most witnesses, and the defense relied primarily on Charles' own testimony about the supposed extortion, a story that was not supported by any clear corroborating fact or by logic. There is no doubt that the strongest evidence for the state out of the calendar and the Selbright reports is the evidence to support the claim that Donna and Harvey were fleeing the country and going to Vietnam to avoid prosecution, something that can be argued to show a consciousness of guilt. There's evidence that since 2022, Harvey and Donna were investing into a Vietnam villa. There's evidence that they paid for it and that they paid to have it furnished. That, in and of itself, does not prove anything illegal and does not give strong support to the conclusion that they were fleeing the country. Rather, the Adelsons could make many reasonable arguments why leaving the country would be a good move. The calendar makes it clear that Donna has high hopes that Charlie would be found innocent. We know that the Adelsons, and particularly Charles, likes to travel to Asia. We know that Charlie was going to testify that a South Florida gang had been involved in the supposed extortion, or that at least he thought that the gang was involved. So it makes sense to get a vacation villa in Asia, and once Charles got home, have the option of leaving the country and spending some time abroad, in a place where no one is likely to have heard about Dan Markell's murder. However, there are dozens of entries in the calendar and on the Celebrate report that contradict this conclusion, and that corroborate the argument that the Adelsons were fleeing the USA to a country that did not have an extradition treaty with the USA, and that also contradict any possible counter-argument that they were leaving the country because they feared retribution from a gang or others implicated by Charles Adelson during his testimony, or even that they were afraid that they might be caught in the net of an unfair justice system. For context, you have to remember that on November 6, not only was Charles Adelson convicted, but Georgia Kappelman, the lead prosecutor, also gave an interview outside of the courtroom, and the first question she was asked was, who is next? As in, who is the next Adelson that will be charged? Kappelman did not give a clear answer, but she did say, stay tuned, suggesting that, indeed, the case was not over, and more arrests may happen. Of course, no gang is as powerful as our government, so those words must have chilled Donna to her bones. So what, in addition to the above, corroborates the fact that they were fleeing the country? Here are a few. Number one, a one-way ticket. Number two, rush timing of the plan to depart. Rush to obtain a Vietnamese visa. Number three, search about whether Vietnam is a non-extradition country. Number four, calendar entries suggesting that they wanted to keep the plan to flee the country secret from close friends. Number five, calendar entries suggesting that Donna wanted to use Dan Rashbaum as a conduit in secret for sharing with Charles the plan to go to Vietnam. Number six, communications with friends showing inconsistent apparent lies about their planned absence. Family emergency versus a vacation. Number seven, communications and calendar entries suggesting that they were making plans for someone to take over the management of their rental properties and other affairs that Donna was involved in handling. Number eight, the fact that Wendy, also an unindicted co-conspirator, was seemingly not invited to go along to Vietnam, 
contradicting any claim of fear of a gang or the government. Number nine, the fact that they planned to disclose the truth of their departure to others only after they got to Vietnam. Many entries in Donna's planner will support the state's argument that Donna was trying to flee the country to avoid justice for what she did. Donna is clearly a meticulous planner, and she puts reminders everywhere about key dates and events, including, for example, the date when a loved one of a close friend lost his or her life, as a reminder for her to make contact with a friend to offer sympathy. It is also clear that Donna is very close to Dan Markell's boys, who often stay at her home, yet there is absolutely nothing on the planet to remind her that Dan Markell, grandkid's father, lost his life on July 19th. Nothing. A review of the planner also further demonstrates how sad this story really is. More on that later. Mentor Lawyer and Stephanie the Sleuth will do part two of this video soon. Thanks for watching, Mentor Lawyer. Thank you.